recording Yeah, in the class no sir sonu is not there okay mm. sir he got a reply from the controller i yes sir he got a reply okay he said that uh, there is nothing to worry about that they will make the necessary corrections okay no, it's not a major problem i mean if you get your registration number wrong then it's a problem or if you don't pay the fees or don't fill up the form That, that will lead to problem. Okay, so uh, Mam has shown you graphically that uh, if there is a change in price, then this will lead to a change in quantity demand. Okay, and this is called we call this the price effect. Okay, it follows from the fact that. demand is a function of prices own price price of other commodities and income okay we know that if own price changes then demand is going to fall so if p1 falls demand is going to rise if p1 rises demand is going to fall uh what happens if p2 rises or fall in that case the effect depends upon whether the commodities are substitutes or complements now suppose it is a two commodity world okay in that case can you tell me what will happen if p2 falls Extra go down because they are only substitute. Extra go down because yeah. they are only substitute. Yeah. In a two commodity world, the commodities must be substitutes. So in that case, demand is going to x one. If price falls, x one will also fall. If price rises, x one will rise. So we have a positive relation. But if there are complements. then you are going to have sorry a negative relation okay ach now what we are looking over over here is just the nature of relationship whether it is a positive relation or whether it is a negative relation between price and demand Okay, so we just know whether what happens if P rises, whether X will go up or whether X will come down. But what we want to find out now is that okay, price has gone up by a certain amount. <coughs> Let us say price has gone up by one unit. How much will demand change so it's not how demand will change but how much this quantity is now relevant 
whether demand will change if I'm talking about own price then I know that demand is going to fall okay but what is the value what is the magnitude of del x is it 2 or rather minus 2 is it minus 1 is it minus 5 what exactly how much does demand change that is what we want to find out uh, as I've told you that this is called the price effect and as MD has shown graphically this can be decomposed into two components which are called income and substitution effect respectively right okay <coughs> now this derivation can also be this decomposition can also be done mathematically in fact it was first done mathematically uh, more than a hundred years ago by a Russi Russian statistician named Evgeny Slutsky uh, the paper is a classic paper and uh, today we are going to discuss uh, go through this decomposition Before going through this uh, decomposition, uh, you need, need to know how the mathematics of uh, consumer equilibrium. So I'll briefly cover this because actually it's a topic which is discussed in the second semester. So a consumer will maximize utility subject to a budget constraint. So this is the budget constraint, this is expenditure and expenditure has to be equal to income. Okay. Now when we have discussed maximization, we had, we had maximized the function, uh, we had maximized functions with only one variable and we had shown that the condition for maximization is f prime x should be positive and then uh, we have to look at the even order so f2 f so it's better if i write it like this f2 f4 if these are negative then it's a maximum but if f2 is positive then it's a i mean it's a, mi a minimum Now it is possible to extend this to cover functions when we are when we have got more than one variable. Here also what we are going to get is dy by dx1 should equal to 0 and dy by dx2 is equal to 0. But what about the second order conditions? In that case we have to form what is known as a Jacobian determinant and this will have certain signs okay in this case what we are having is we are having what is called a constrained max ma uh, constrained optimization problem okay in this case specific case it is constrained maximization but we can also have uh, constrained minimization problems in this case what we do is we have to form what is known as a Lagrangian function and then we have to maximize this so the Lagrangian function is written like this this is the objective function and this is the constraint so we write this as the objective function minus the 
the constraint. Okay, sir. So plus lambda and this is the So note how I have written it. I have written it as m minus p1 x1 minus p2 x2. Another way of writing it is I could have written minus lambda. In that case, I would have brought I've, I would have written it in this way. Okay, so both of them are right. But if I write it in this way, this is wrong. this is wrong or if I write it in this way this is also wrong okay. both of them are wrong now once we have got it got a function like this look at it carefully uh, I'm going to work with the first type of function this one <coughs> how many variables are there the choice variables are x1 and x2 Achha. by the way I forgot to tell you this lambda is called the Lagrangian multiplier and this as I've told you this entire thing is the Lagrangian function okay now the Lagrangian multiplier is also a variable in this function okay so that means when we take the differential we have to see this is a function which is just like this multiple variable so that means we can simply tr ignore that this is a constraint max maximization problem we can treat treat it as a uh, multiple variable objective function without any constraint okay. are you getting the are you understanding what I'm saying? Oh, am I going? Yes, okay. Yes, sir. Okay. So, if it is a multiple variable problem, we simply have to take the first derivative with respect to the choice variables. So, there are three choice variables. So, these are the first order or necessary conditions. I have to take the differential of the Lagrangian function with respect to x1, x2 and lambda and I have to set this as 0. Achha. Now if I take the deri partial derivative of this, what do I get? I will get u1. Remember if I am differentiating with respect to x1, then x2 and lambda are held constant. So this will be del u by del x1 which is u1. Now in this function, m is a uh, lambda is a constant, so I put lambda. Okay, over here, so I get minus p one. Right, so I can write this as lambda p one, and this is equal to zero. So what will be the second function? This one. U2 minus lambda P2 Yeah. And the third one? Lambda? M minus P1 X1 minus P2 X2 minus P2 X2. 
I simply get the constraint. Okay. If I have three commodities, then I'll have a th third equation u3 minus lambda p3 equal to 0. Okay, so these three are the represent the first order condition. Okay. Will I remove this? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Right. Now, as you know, that uh, if I try to maximize, of, if I uh, look at the extremum points, I can have three situations. It can be a max, it can be a maximum, or it can be a minimum. Okay, let's focus on these two. Because remember, there is also the possibility of points of inflection. So, in case of a single variable function. Now, if I see the problem over here is whether it is a maximum or a minimum, the condition, first order condition is the same. Okay, the derivative is equal to, first derivative is equal to 0. So, how do I distinguish between maximum and minimum? here we have to look at a uh, matrix. How is the matrix formed? We take the second order determinants. So there are two commodities u11, u12. This will be u21, u22 and over here and this is a zero. This is called, see look over here, we have borders over here. That is why it is called a bordered Hessian determinant and we write, write this as this. <coughs> Suppose it is a 3 commodity, what will be the bordered Hessian? Minus P1. Yes. Then U21, U2, U23, then minus P2, U31, U32, U33, minus P2, then minus P1, minus P2, minus P3, 0. So what we do is we can call this one H2, we call this one H3 to denote the order. Okay, H2 means how many commodities there are. So that means the order will be 2 plus 1, 3. Here the order is 4. Yes. So why is it zero out there? Uh, see, at this point, I uh, I don't want to go into the derivation of bordered Hessian, but uh, you can think of it as uh, 
Well, I mean, this is how the bordered Hessian looks like. Uh, when MD will cover this topic in the next semester, you will understand why it takes a form like this. Okay, but what I want to say is that you can see that it is symmetric. It has a symmetry over here. Yes, sir. I mean, you have the prices over here and the borders this is zero and over here you have the uh, second order derivatives of the utility function now uh, I have forgotten this because it's so long that I know it okay Now, if you, if I want to take the, uh, find out whether it is a maximum or minimum, I have to f find out this determinant. And let us say the second order condition for maximization is as follows. Suppose we have a two commodity world, H2 will be positive. If it is a three commodity world, this will be negative. If it is a four commodity world, positive yeah and if it is an in commodity world so it depends on the value of n no, it, if it is even then it is greater than zero and if it's wait. odd then wait 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 and right Yes, sir. Next, tell me something. Uh, I'm not writing the, I'm not putting in the determinant signs, okay? It, uh, so, I put in two determinants, okay? Two bordered Hessian determinants. It's not possible for you to tell me what the signs are unless I tell you what, whether n is odd or even, right? Yes, sir. But can you tell me what is this? If I divide, what is this? Why? Because it will be If it is minus n minus 1, then each n would be positive. Exactly, sir. Yeah. Either, I mean, if one is positive, other one will be negative. Yeah. Or either it will be like this or it will be like this. Depending on whether n is odd or even. Okay. So, that means if I take the ratio of hn minus 1 and hn, it is going to be negative. So, this result we are going to use at the end of the derivation. Now let us come to the decomposition of the price effect. Uh, we will do the analysis for a three, uh, three commodity world. The reason is that if you go for a, a four commodity or five commodity is obviously better, but the problem is unnecessarily complicated. 
three can be generalized very easily. Two is very simple, but it can't be generalized. Okay, so in that case, our objective function is we have got three commodities. So we maximize utility subject to income your expenditure in x1, x2 and x3. Okay. So what are the first order conditions? U1 minus lambda P1 is equal to 0. U2 minus lambda P2 equals to 0. U3 minus lambda P3 equals to 0. And then the budget constraint. Yes, sir. Now, what I want to do is, let us suppose that there is a change in P1. Okay. Now, if we solve for them, we are going to get demand functions. X1 is a function of prices and income. X2 is a function of prices and income. This is the, these are the three demand functions. So keep this in mind. <coughs> okay, now first what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this part. See, I have U is a function of X1, X2, X3. What is U1? U1 is simply right so U1 will also be a function of X1, X2, X3 ok is this clear it may turn out to be that uh, the second some of the second derivatives can be zero but uh, in generally we can write this in this way so i have got u1 minus lambda p1 okay let us look at u1 when p1 changes what happens from the inner demand function x1 will change right if x1 changes what will happen over here u1 u1 will change okay now what is this this part del u1 by del x1 u1 1 and this is simply dx1 by dp1. Achha, now we come to lambda. Okay. Uh, first let us take lambda to be constant. So it will be dp1 by dp1 which is simply minus lambda. Right? Then we have to take P1 constant. Sorry, sorry. I've made a change. Uh, what happens over here? Yeah. 
okay i forgot to write this similarly over here lambda is also a function of the variables okay so uh, over here it will be when p1 changes lambda will also change this is equal to 0 Okay, is it clear? And now I can do some housekeeping. Oh, sorry, I made one mistake. Mm. Sorry. Big mistake. <coughs> See, this part have you understood? this how I've differentiated lambda p1 over here <laughs> sir will you put it once more Achha. Achha. in that case what I what I will do is since I've made a slight mistake uh, let me finish up with u1 See, if P1 changes, what will happen to X2? X2 will also change? Yes, sir. Okay. If X2 changes, what is going to happen? P1 will also change. This will be plus. Similarly, this is also true for x3. P1 changes. U1 will change. Okay. So I can write this as this is what U12. Okay, so the simple u1 part can be written if I take the derivative becomes this. Okay. Okay, now let us go for the lambda pi part. First, I'm taking lambda constant. Okay, this is a u into v format. So, I'm taking, keeping lambda constant and I'm differentiating p1 with respect to p1. So, this is simply lambda dp1 dp1 becomes 1. Now, if I'm using the uv format, then the next step is P1, sorry, this will be D lambda by DP1. Okay, I can't simplify this, so I just write down this term. And this is equal to 0, so I write equal to 0. Over here, I'm using the chain rule. And over here, I'm using the product rule. Okay, you are aware of the chain rule and product rule? Yes. Okay, so is this clear? Yes, sir. Okay. 
So what I have done is u11 dx1 by dp1 u12 Okay, then P1 D lambda by DP1 and now I'm taking the lambda to this side. Okay, I'm taking the lambda is sent over here. Okay, so I have all the derivatives over here and then I have the different terms over here. Is it clear? Okay. So actually this derivation unless you work it out on your own uh, you will get into trouble. So after today's class you should just sit and try to work it out. Now let us take the second condition. This is u2 minus lambda p2 is equal to 0. Okay, so if dp1 changes, what will change? x1, x2, x3, all of them will change. So let us say when p1 changes, x1 changes, this will lead to a change in u2. Again, if P1 changes, this will lead to a change in X2 and the change in X2 will lead to a change in U2. And this is the third term. This is what DX3. And this is U2. Okay, so I can write this as u21. See, this dx1, dp1 remains same. This is u22. And this is u23. Achha, now let us come to my minus lambda p2. So if I use the same format as before, dp2 by dp1 and this will be p2 d lambda by dp1. Now what is this term? Sir, p2 is a constant. So this is going to become 0. And I've got P2. Okay, so if I write this down, it becomes what? U21 DX1 by DP1 U22 DX2 by DP1 This is P2 and what is over here? Zero. We have zero. Sir. Yes. Sir, can you repeat the that y that lambda into dp2 by dp1 turn to zero? This part? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. See, what are the parameters in the system? What are the constant? M, P1, P2, P3. Okay? Now, we are assuming that P1 changes. But income is same. P2 
price P two is same, P three is same. So what will be oh, sir, P two by down to zero? Yes, P yes, two is constant. Now I've lost it. Sometimes the cursor disappears. Uh, okay. Now, can you tell me what the third line will be? U three one. Into. The x one will be one. Okay, so this part will be same. Okay, the next term will be not bond any yes. please. So u three two d x two by d p one plus u three three d x three by d p one minus two zero. This will be minus. Minus p three p three dx p one. Okay. Okay. So this part is clear. So now we come to the third part. This constraint part. <coughs> Dm by dp one. Okay. What will be this? Zero. Income is constant. Minus okay. This is see P one is also a variable now. X one is also a variable. So P one d x one by d P one and then x one d P one by d P one. Okay. Now the second term P two is a constant. So P two, and this will be simply d x two by d p one. I need not differentiate P two; it's a constant. If I do, it will be just zero. The third term will be P three d x three by d p one. Then I've got zero over here. Okay, so this is I can write it over here. P one d x one by P one. This is minus P two. This is P three. Okay, is there any d lambda by d P one? There's no d lambda over here. Okay. Now this is equal to z equal to one, so I've got minus x one. I take this over to the right hand side. Okay, and just to ensure consistency, I write like this. This is dot. Let me remove this. Okay, is it clear? So, 
if you don't understand understand a step let me know okay So this is what I've got. So this is a matrix, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So if I write the matrix, I can write the matrix like this. U11, U12, u13 and what will come over here minus p1 this is u21 u22 u yeah. yeah can u you dictate two please two. it will help me minus p2 yeah u31 u32 u33 minus p2 18 last row the 18 Minus P1, minus P2, minus P3, and 0. So this is dx1 by dp1, dx2 by dp1, dx3 by dp1, and this is d lambda by dp1. So, this is equal to lambda 0, 0, x1. Okay? Now, using Kramer's rule, we can find out any of these three terms. We are not really interested in what happens to lambda. But we can find out what happens if p1 changes, what will happen to x1, what will happen to x2, what will happen to x3. So, let me find out what will happen to x1. Okay, so this matrix is also important. Now, what does Kramer's rule tell me? How to find out dx1 by dp1? So, we replace the lambda 0, 0, 0, x1 with the first column. Yeah. So, if I want to find out the first variable, I have to replace this first column. That will come in the numerator. So, lambda 0, 0, x1. Uh, okay, can you tell me, uh, please dictate this. U12, U13, minus P1. Yeah, what will be the second row, please? U22, U23, U23, minus P2. And U31, U32, U33, minus P3. Uh, no, no, it's a U32. Have it. Huh. 3, 2, yeah. U3, 3, minus P3. Minus P2 minus P3 0. What is what will come in the denominator? So the, the matrix O matrix or yeah. the determinant. Uh, 
okay can you tell me what this determinant is first thing this is the water hessian determinant so i'm just writing numerator over here this becomes h3 so what is this uh, i'll come to this later but just at this point what is h3 what is the sign of h3 since we are maximizing it is negative okay now let us look at the numerator so what we can do is we can uh, expand this denominator taking the first column so this will be lambda this is lambda and uh, okay so we have to take this sub matrix u22 u23 minus p2 let us put this p3 this will be what 32 and this is 33 this is minus p2 minus p3 this is 0 okay this is plus this is minus plus minus no sorry uh, plus minus plus minus so i've got x1 and this is u12 u13 minus p1 u22 u23 minus p2 Okay. Now tell me what is this? What is the first determinant? Sir H two. what is this determinant it's not whatever it is it's not a bordered hessian bordered hessian should have zero zero over here and price is over here so let's keep it aside Now what is dx1 by dp1 it is lambda h3 minus
this matrix. Now let's go back to the original first order condition. Um yeah. And remember that xi is a function of P1, P2 and M. Lambda is also a function of P1, P2 and M. Okay, now let what we want to do is we want to find out the income effect. What happens when income changes? What will happen to dx1? This is what we want to find out. So let's first solve this. Okay, so suppose m changes, then x1 will change. I am looking at the first condition. If x1 changes, then u1 will change. Right? What is the second term? Exactly. So when m changes, x2 will change. Uh, sorry, x2 changes, u1 changes. This is dx3 by dm. Achha, now, remember p1 is now a constant. So, p1 comes over here and I just have d lambda sorry it's not x it will be m equal to 0 so what do I get this is u11 dx1 by dm this is u12 dx2 by dm this is u13 <coughs> dx3 by dm this is p1 d lambda by dm equal to 0. What is the second term? It will be u21 dx by dm dx1 by dm hmm. plus u22 dx2 by dm plus u323 dx3 by dm minus p2 d lambda dm equals to 0. And the third term will be, third line will be? U31 dx1 by dm plus u32 dx2 by dm plus u33 dx3 by dm minus p3 dx lam d lambda by dm equals to 0. Yeah. Now we come to this term. So dm by dm is 1. then all the pms are constant equal to 0 so i can write this as minus p1 dx1 by dm 
minus 2 dx2 by dm okay I'm keeping this there's no d lambda over here but I keep this so that it becomes easier and now this becomes minus 1 So what is dx1 by dm? Let's look at the numerator first. U11, one one, U12, one and so on, like this. U11, one one, U12, one U13, one what is the third term? It is minus P1. Then you have got u21, u22, u23 minus p2. This is 31, 32. Zero. Okay. Now what is this? Okay, but let's uh, let's keep it like this. Okay, at the moment. Okay, I forgot one thing. Over here, this should be divided by the bordered Hessian, right? I left out the bordered Hessian over here. The entire numerator should be divided by bordered Hessian. I divided the first component, not the second component. <coughs> Now, what is this? This is the bordered Hessian, H3. What is this? Zero. Zero. One. You one. Minus one. You one two. Wait. This will be U22. This is U32. And what is this? Uh, minus P2. No, no, no. Wait. So is this a bordered Hessian determinant? It's not because the first component is minus 1. And secondly, this in fact the first column clearly indicates it's not a bordered Hessian. So I can ex expand it using the first column.
so minus okay so that means I have to take this term okay but is it minus see plus minus plus minus it becomes plus and now what is the matrix so u12 u13 minus p1 u22 u23 minus p2 u32 u33 minus p3 okay actually over here i have made a mistake it should have been you can't have u33 and 33 right both cannot be u33 this was actually u32 look at this matrix and this matrix same just look at this part yes sir this is identical yes sir so that means you see we have got so many terms it becomes very complicated so I'll go back and correct this later on but uh, oh no wait I have to correct this part also right Now, dx1 by dp1 is equal to second order bordered Hessian by the third order bordered Hessian. And this is equal to minus dx1 by dm. Okay, so this is you can see you can easily understand that this is the income effect. What happens to demand when income changes? And this was interpreted by Slutsky as the substitution effect. is the income effect okay. so the price effect is can be decomposed into two effects the substitution effect and the income effect now what about the signs? See, we know that H2 and H3 will be <coughs> will differ in sign. Therefore, the and I mean I can't show this to you easily, but 
sorry. Uh, it can be shown that lambda also is positive. Okay, so if this is positive, and the ratio is negative, the substitution effect will always be negative. Okay, because of the H two H three relationship. Now, what is the sign of X one? This is positive. What is the sign of? In case of a normal good, what is d x one by d n? This is also positive for normal good. Okay, but suppose I write it in this format. Okay, so in that case, what is the sign of the income effect? So this minus is over here. X one is positive, d x one is also positive. So in that case, both the price effect and substitution effect are negative, right? Sorry, both the substitution effect, income effect, are negative, and therefore the price effect will also be negative. Is it clear? I'm just taking. Rewriting this, just manipulating. I'm defining the income effect to include the minus sign. Now, in the in a general case, let us say dxi by dpj. I mean, what you should now do is try to find out <coughs> using the same matrix. We had found out dx1 by dp1. Now, try to find out. dx1 by dp2 okay and you will see that the term that you get is will be same Hmm. Here, uh, why the substitution effect is negative? Where? Sir, in, uh, in this dx1 case, dx1 by dp1. Oh, the h2 and h3. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me go to the PowerPoint. Oh yes, sir. Yes, sir. Got it. Yes, sir. Okay. So where do I have to make the change? Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 This will be three two, and over here I can write H three. Okay. 
okay so this is the derivation of the income and substitution effect uh, the classic paper by Slutsky so now you're all Russian statisticians if you can work it out on your own you can claim to be very good Russian statisticians um, you will get a derivation in Chiang and Wen, right? Pages 378 to 380. A slightly different, uh, using a slightly different notation. Mm. I have taught from a class notes, uh, from a class lecture. But uh, our teacher himself taught it from, I think, uh, at least uh, I could. I got the same derivation in John Hicks's value and capital in the mathematical appendix. So I read it in 87 April. So I don't remember the page number or uh, exactly what was the serial of the mathematical appendix. Chiang Wainwright you will find it a bit difficult to follow because he uses a slightly different notation. So I would say that you go through the notes What I will do is, page 82 to 92, let me save this first, yeah. I'll take, I'll give you a printout of this. So I'll post both the lecture uh, wait a minute let me type the name properly so I'll send you this uh, PDF and please go through both the slide PDF you've got two videos you've got one slide uh, what I would strongly suggest is that you try to derive this on your own unless you do the derivation on your own you will not be able to find out uh, understand what happens if there's any problem I will discuss it in the next class that is one secondly try to find out what is dx2 by dp1 let me see if i've got the okay anyway it, uh, yeah the pdf has come that is what i was worrying about So over here I have found out derive what is dx1 by dp1. Instead of that try to find out what is dx2 by dp1. So in that case you have to just replace this column by this column. Okay, Most of the derivation will be the same. So try to find this out yourself. Okay. So I don't, if I try to teach something else, 
now uh, i don't think i uh, well i just want to cover one very small topic uh, i just need one slide for this which is i forgot to cover one this part assumptions of input the input output model but uh, before that uh, you know what the course is right i have already sent you the course before the mid mid sem and the parts which are marked in red were not part of the earlier ie exams but now they are also part of the internal assessment exams uh, of the final exams you have also got your routine so on the first day you are going in my paper you are going to have the written exam i've got about 6 7 black backlogs so i'll take the viva of the backlog students and those of you who want to take a viva on the first day itself uh, please let me know i will also fit in your viva along with the backlog students but for the class as a whole in general what i'm going to do is i'm going to take the viva from the on the second and third day respectively okay is this fine yes sir yeah acha okay now about the assumptions of the input output matrix Uh, there are three assumptions first is that the input output any of the input output coefficients aig should be less than 1 see what will what is aig how is how do we define aig aig is defined as the amount of xig used to produce xj if it is greater than 1 it implies that i am using let us say mm, sorry this will be One second, please. Okay. Bring this a fourth assumption. first is that all the coefficients are non negative because otherwise see as as we have defined aig is defined as xi j in xj the amount of okay so if it is negative it implies that either xij is negative or xj is negative both of which are non nonsensical basically what it implies is that if you are using an input in an industry 
then the output actually decreases. So if you are using more of labor, output actually falls. If you are using more of coal, output of steel falls. which is nonsensical. The second thing is that it is, uh, it has to be, it cannot be greater than 1. Suppose it is greater than 1. See, it's not obvious in a physical sense, uh, but if you suppose you multiply by prices, okay, in that case, what do you get? If you multiply by the respective prices, the value of the coal and this is the value of the output is greater than 1. So it means that if you use 1000 rupees of coal, you are producing 500 rupees of steel. So what will happen? You are going to get negative profits. There is no point in production. Third is column sum should be less than unity. See, if you remember in input output, the column sum was uh, simply the inputs okay so again the total inputs cannot be greater than 1 it implies that your input is greater than output so all these are very important technological assumption but they are intuitive the last one is that AIJ is constant. So that means if you increase XJ, AIJ will still be same. Now this implies constant returns to scale. Okay. And the resultant technology, the input output function can be represented by L shaped isocons. So remember, negatives has to be non-negative, AIJ has to be lie between 0 and 1. The column sum, it can be 0, but it cannot be negative and it cannot be equal to 1 also. The column sum should be less than unity and the third most important assumption that AIGs are constant which implies that you have constant returns to scale and L-shaped isocons. You know what is constant returns to scale? That you are increasing all the inputs. Suppose production is a function of labor and capital. So if you increase labor and capital by lambda, then output also increases by lambda. Can you tell me what is the homogeneity in this case? Degree one. It is degree 1. Okay. So, with this, I will end the chapter on matrices. So, go through these slides. Let me close the OBS.